One. So good afternoon everyone and welcome to our recap of CloudNativeCon and KubeCon. I'm Johan Tortron and to today I have my co-worker Christian Klein with me. So we're going to give you some updates about our impressions of the big conference, discuss a bit about what are the trends, what are our takeaways, so how Cloud Native will pan out in the future. And in the end, we'll answer, we'll answer any questions you have. So please ask questions throughout the, our short presentation in the chat and we'll answer them as, as we go. So first of all, I'll tell you a bit about the impressions so far. And I think the greatest thing was that KubeCon now actually was a virtual conference instead of a physical conference. And I think overall that transition went pretty smoothly. So I mean, using a combination of online video, some pre-recorded talks, live chat, some live panels, and quite a lot of interactions over both video and chat. And as an attendee, I mean, there are clear benefits to this. First of all, you can attend from your home and don't have to travel all across the world to attend. And it's much easier to go between talks, sort of catch up with what you, what you didn't see, get some immediate feedback from others, what were the good talks, and so on. And also, as I understand it from the various vendors I talked to, also that sort of interaction with the, the vendors worked fine with the virtual booth. And very easy to get information about new products in the cloud native space. And overall, I said the experience was better than expected. And I mean, there was a decent experience overall. You can see videos, see the people talking, asking questions real time, and so on. Yeah, pretty good. On the other hand, when you gather many thousand people in some chat rooms, it can be a pretty low signal to noise ratio and a lot of people are just applauding and so on. It's kind of hard to follow some discussions, but very good overall. So let's talk a bit more about the, the Cloud Native products and the Kubernetes product and the various updates. So, I mean, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation has defined three different levels of products that they host. And they also map this down to the adoption curve. And at the lowest level, we have sandbox product. And the sandbox product is really just the open source product that seems to solve an interesting problem in the cloud native space. And that's pretty much everything that's required to be accepted into sandbox. It should be a good idea. It should be open source. Uh, raising the bar a bit, we have various products that has been selected as incubating ones in here. There's actually quite some due diligence happening from the technical oversight committee at the CNCF, including actually downloading and trying out the project, looking a bit more into the processes the product adopt, talking to some users, what do, how do they use this product, does it really work and so on. And the top level is then the graduated product and these are battle proven technologies that have been used in production by many users and have a solid base of committers and really are ready to be used mainstream. So looking, in, looking into this then, where are we right now? So right now we have a set of 11 graduated products. Recent graduates from this year is the Harbor Container Registry, which allows you to run your own private container registry apply some vulnerability scanning to that one and also add policies for what kind of container images you're allowed to deploy to your cluster as opposed to just downloading images from a public docker hub. And other graduate from this year is Helm, the, the Kubernetes package manager. And if you look back a few years, the first products graduated was Kubernetes back in 2018 rather quickly followed by Prometheus and Envoy, and then the rest of the products shown in this figure graded last year. So I mean, even though these um, technologies are assigned or are esteemed to be production ready, many of them are rather novel. Looking further into incubating products, we have a larger set of products here, and a few very recent additions are the Contour, the ingress controller that's built on the Envoy proxy, the Argo GitOps tool, the operator framework for exposing your applications as 
using the same logic for life cycle management as Kubernetes itself. The very lean K3S distro or way of running Kubernetes as a single binary. And as of yesterday, the Cortex scalable version of Prometheus actually was accepted into incubation. So overall, there's a, there's a fast pace here in technology development. So I think I'll actually hand over then to Christian to go into some, some more depth about selected areas and technologies. Yes, so hello everybody. Thank you for attending our summary of KubeCon. Let me just present to you in brief what are the big trends and highlights of uh, this year's KubeCon. So we looked a little bit at the number of attendees per Slack channel for each session. Um, I'm not sure to what extent these are representative for the interest, but well, given that the event was virtual, this is as good as it could get to counting heads in a presentation room. And notice that CICD was the most popular topic, afterwards followed by service meshes, operations, and then observability was still a topic that was pretty high on, on everybody's mind. Let's uh, get into some of these topics and yeah, see, see what were the highlights of this year. So one of the things that kind of struck me when, uh, when I looked at KubeCon is that the community is increasingly trying to focus on end users. You can become an end user member of the CMCF, um, and you somebody that uses cloud native technologies, in particular Kubernetes, but without being somebody that sells these kind of services uh, to somebody else. And um, end user members are getting significant discounts on their membership, and they're also receiving a lot more attention, so there are special presentations for end users and group for end users. And they even introduced now an end user award, so somebody who has significantly contributed to the ecosystem to drive requirements and to give a direction and purpose to the whole ecosystem. And this was received this year by Zalando, the, um, the online e-commerce website. There has been also a lot more of one-on-one -on -one sessions, so there was um, a problem a few years ago that as the ecosystem is gaining more and more speed, there are of course people that are being left behind, and therefore there was a call for more one-on-one -on -one sessions, so something like back to the basics of what we're talking about. And it was kind of refreshing to see that there was even a session on how to navigate KubeCon itself. Um, there are also special end user groups that are being built up, such as the telco user group and the financial user group. So one of them being more interested or having special requirements on how network is being done, and the other one having stronger uh, security and uh, compliance requirements. And the Cloud Native Foundation has even started a so-called Cloud Native Radar. So for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of technology radar, many organizations are just charting what's out there and classifying technologies either as hold, so a bit like, well, this technology feels immature, don't put your bets on it yet, um, as test, which means that, well, this is starting to be kind of mature and adopted by many people, but still try to assess if it's valid for your use case or not. And then adopt status would mean that, well, this is technology that's, that is recommended to be used and that is mature enough, that is battle proven, everybody should, uh, should adopt it. And this is if you realize a little bit orthogonal to the incubation status that Johan just spoke about, because this cloud native radar is actually from the uh, build based on service from the end user community. So even if your project is maybe not seeing that many committers or maybe doesn't have the government's uh, doc documents quite written correctly, but if the end users are seeing a lot of value and have already been used them in, in, uh, in production, then of course this project will show differently on the cloud native radar compared to their incubation status. So very interesting to see the end users uh, viewpoint injected more and more into the cloud native community. The other thing that I wanted to highlight um, is that there is increasingly focus on diversity. So as some of you are aware, this year has been plagued with a pandemic that has increased the rifts in society that, that were already there and has led also to some, some mass protests uh, and so on. And there is an increasingly desire from the community to be part of the solution, not part of the problem when it comes to diversity. So they have been doing things like renaming branches. Uh, there is an active effort to rename branches from master to main so as to move away from language that could be perceived as making links to past history of slavery. Uh, there is also an active encouragement to um, not use gendered or language that is perceived gender. So for example, there was a slack about that. Whenever you would say, hi guys, it was kindly suggesting you to move away from that term and instead use hi folks or hi everyone 
and uh, high all, which is perceived to be more gender neutral nowadays. Inclusiveness was also um, manifested by things, for example, like Linkerd, that made an effort to internationalize the dashboard so that people who do not have English as a native speaker, um, as a native language, could use Linkerd more accessibly. And then, of course, we saw that more women and minorities are being put in key roles of the cloud native foundations, such as general manager, technical oversight committee, and so on. And we even see on the right side of the slides a screenshot from somebody tweeting a panel in which four out of the five members were, um, were belonging to, were female identified or non binary. So that was really nice and refreshing. Let's go on to a little bit uh, more technological trends. So one of the technologies that people are really excited about and they want to see this uh, maturing and getting out as quickly as possible is Cluster API. So this is essentially a, an API uh, inside Kubernetes that allows you to use a Kubernetes cluster in order to manage, to create, destroy, or upgrade other Kubernetes clusters. And the way it works is if you're familiar with custom resource definitions, basically Cluster API is just some custom resource definitions which a controller that is specific to each of the major cloud vendors. And then when you're creating one of those resources or you're destroying one of those resources, well, that has an effect on the provider and creates or destroys a Kubernetes cluster behind the scenes. Right now, Cluster API is in version one alpha three. Um, it is expected to become beta soon. And there we have had uh, mixed feelings because some people are actually using it already in production nowadays, whereas others, for example, they have a strict policy of only using general availability features. And so they're really waiting for this API to stabilize so they can uh, take advantage of it. But nevertheless, it seems to be on everybody's mind. Uh, so it, it's now nowadays supported by AWS, uh, Google's cloud, VMware, and so on. And also some bare metal providers such as Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, but also, let's say, some smaller European providers such as Exoscale. And it was quite fascinating to see that, for example, v VMware had um, used their sponsored demo slot actually for showing up how they support Cluster API on top of VMware vSphere. So you can definitely see how important this has become to everybody. Now, there is some confusion about Cluster API and the Kubernetes Cloud Controller. And I just wanted to make sure that everybody is on the same page that these are not the same thing. So cluster API is something, a, a relatively new controller that creates Kubernetes clusters. Whereas in every Kubernetes cluster, you have a Kubernetes cloud controller that talks to the, um, to the underlying cloud provider to create load balancers, to destroy load balancers, to attach persistent volumes and so on. So these are completely dis distinct things. And like I said, the Kubernetes cloud controller is, is a way more mature technology. Okay, um, Cluster API is nowadays seen as a increasingly important building block in a trend which is called GitOps. And basically this is the idea of making all the system changes via the Git commits. So we're no longer SSH into a machine or you know, talk directly to Kubernetes API, but once you reach production, really want to basically write some code, commit to Git, and then there is some kind of process that makes sure that those changes are being um, applied to production environments. And this has several advantages. First of all, you get an audit log for free. You know exactly who did what change. Uh, if your Git is already having something like um, reviews in place, then you also get a four eyes policy for free. And of course, it also leads to way more reliable deployments since nowadays all the knowledge of how your software is running production is captured via source code. And you don't have, to, you don't have tribal knowledge anymore in your organization. And so major projects that are, um, that are operating in the GitOps space are Orgo, Flux, and Helm. Uh, the last two are actually being classified by the end user community as adopt grade, whereas we see that we have also some other, um, some other solutions like uh, GitLab and CircleCI and so on that of course they see wide adoption, but they're still a little bit on a on an assessed status. And like I said, uh, seems, seems like GitOps is a very important topic because it has been given kind of the first, um, it's the first ever technology radar that the CNCF produces. And this also facilitates cluster to be seen more and more as throwaway. So instead of having to carefully upgrade your clusters and make a careful node rotation, well, whenever you need to upgrade the underlying Kubernetes, you just throw the old, sorry, you create a new cluster and then you migrate your workloads on it and throw the old cluster away. 
or you can also have throwaway clusters for running various tests in your workloads or to check if, uh, if the configuration is correctly, if the performance is, uh, of your application is okay, and so on. Let's move on now to another topic, uh, which is that Cloud Native Foundation wants to more and more address um, telco grade use cases that are coming from the telco industry and also from what they call edge native use cases. So for those who are not familiar with these uh, terms, um, the telecom industry has some special requirements when it comes to networking. They really want your pods to have direct access to the network card so that, for example, you can do stuff like forwarding millions of packets per second and instantiate what they call network functions, such as firewall and routers that are you kind of program the network card to act as a firewall and router with the user space process, uh, deciding what to do in the special cases. And this pattern is being uh, increasingly adopted by the uh, Cloud Native Foundation too. So there are nowadays, there is an increasing focus on Cloud Native functions, where basically you have um, network functions that are created or destroyed via custom resource definitions in a Kubernetes cluster. Now, the other use case is edge native. So there is an increasing desire to see Kubernetes clusters running in things like Kales, things like cars, things like maybe a submarine that is uh, not always connected to the internet and things like that. And they even put it uh, as, as a nice metaphor. We want to be able to run a Kubernetes cluster in a van where you know it's, it's driving by uh, cell towers. It might or might not have network connectivity uh, as required. So two projects stand out in this space. It is uh, K3S. Um, this is a project for Rancher, which is uh, supposed to target the edge native computing use case. And then if you want also to use your edge nodes as some kind of form of storage, then it seems like the Longhorn project is the one that is getting most attention in, in this particular space. Let's move on now to storage. So Kubernetes was initially thought for stateless workloads where you could just um, yeah, spin up new, new pods or destroy on your pods. And, and there would be, you know, you try to architect your applications to be as stateless as possible, simply pushing state to the clients or pushing state in some special purpose infrastructures for dealing with database and storage and so on. But of course, it is increasingly desirable to use, to standardize on Kubernetes and to also have your stateful workloads on top of Kubernetes. And th this state can be manifest in various ways. You can either have cloud native databases, uh, block storage, or massive queues. And when it comes to databases, uh, Vitesse and uh, Taikivi are kind of extending MySQL in a way that makes it work across several nodes so that the failure of any single one is not affecting the um, consistency and integrity of the database as a whole. When we get block storage, of course, in most of the big cloud providers, we're using the block storage provided by the cloud provider itself. However, this is not always desirable. You might have use cases where you want to run your workloads on bare metal. You might want to use more or less redundancy than the underlying cloud provider uh, provides you with. Otherwise, you might want to run a Kubernetes cluster on a cloud provider that is maybe smaller and doesn't offer any kind of virtual storage to attach to. And in this case, any of the project Longhorn, Rook, or Open EBS are standing out as the contender for the best block storage solution out there. Finally, um, components often talk via message queues. This allows, for example, one component to restart or to temporarily fail and stop processing messages while the producer is still producing messages. And then, of course, as the consumers come, come back up online, they would catch up with consuming messages. And of course, in order to enable this loose coupling, you need some kind of message queue, which although it stores state for a very short amount of time, but it's still something that's pretty stateful and needs to be handled a little bit more delicately. And this, um, again, a bit like the last year, uh, the Nets project is kind of standing out as the go-to solution for cloud native message queues. Now, um, it seems like this space is moving forward. So for example, TyTV and Rook are likely to graduate soon. They're currently in incubating state. And like I said, uh, there's increasing adoption for stateful applications in Kubernetes itself. Let us now uh, move on to security. So I kept kind of the, the best for the last. Um, this has probably been the most, how to say, multifaceted and most interesting thing that, that the community was talking about. So the reason is that Kubernetes has already proven itself as a very good building block in order to deliver features fast. And now it kind of has to prove itself that you can also do secure development 
at the same pace as you do fast development. And there is an increasing focus on shifting left security. Now, this is a bit of a controversial um, term because it kind of suggests like you're going to throw, you're going to fire your security team and then the developers will take in over security. But that's not what, this, mess, what this, this word is supposed to mean. It's more like you're extending security left. So your security team stays more as the subject matter experts and they're setting up policies and network partition and vulnerability scanners and so on in order to make sure that the developers are empowered and can actually take care of security for let's say the more mundane cases. And so that only the more tricky and more complicated cases fall on the table of the security people. And the reason for this is kind of simple because in some organizations, especially in regulated industry, the security team cuts quickly overwhelmed with all the security review work. And then they kind of become the bottleneck for pushing features ahead. So let me highlight some of the projects that were showcased in order to deal with all of these security topics. So Aqua Security was showing off how to use uh, Trivi and Open Policy Agent in order to vulnerability scanning. So this in essence means that Trivi is um, a software. It's integrated, for example, with the Harbor Docker registry. And it actually looks at your container images, looking at things like Debian packages and YAM packages and NPM dependencies or, or, or pip -env dependencies and really tells you, well, I found these kind of vulnerabilities in your container, and there are, there are so many critical vulnerabilities, there are so many medium level vulnerabilities, and it's up to you to decide. Hopefully, based on your internal policy, the decision would be, let's upgrade this within seven days. Um, the, um, where, where does Trivi get its vulnerabilities from? There is a database of common vulnerabilities, which very carefully tags what packages out there are vulnerable. And like I said, Trivi, stands out in this space because it's the one that supports the most packet formats out, out there. And of course, open policy agent can be, so Drive itself doesn't take anything. It just gives you information about the vulnerability posture of your container images. You need actually something that enforces an action based on the status of these containers. And you can either use open policy agent in order to make sure that you cannot push vulnerable containers to production, or you can use um, Harbor in order to make sure that, well, it blocks pulling vulnerable images from the container registry. And there are other solutions also that kind of continuously look at vulnerable images inside the cluster and make sure that, um, yeah, that you're informed about vulnerabilities that just appeared. Um, this is also a very important topic that was highlighting that just because an image wasn't vulnerable yesterday, since CVEs tend to appear and be published over time, it might be that in a week your well-known and good image is start to get vulnerable. So then you need a constant notification about that. Another uh, system that was really nicely showcased for intrusion detection is Palco. So this was demonstrated by Shopify, an end user, and Sysdic, which is the company beside, behind Falco. And basically what they were doing is that Shopify showed that since, well, it's a, it's a payment processor, it gets plenty of attacks and they had quite a few hurdles with that. They're, you know, they're dealing with money, so they're a very attractive target to attackers. And then Falco, what it does, it looks at all of the system calls that are happening on um, from the Linux kernel's perspective. And then if there is any suspicious activity, it would just notify a, um, a development team about that. So suspicious activity could mean like somebody tries to read ETC password or tries to write into ETC, or maybe they're trying to make a network connection outside the cluster when they're not supposed to, and so on. And then of course, Falco can, uh, once you have learned what are the acceptable, what are the not so acceptable patterns, uh, based, if you have a good intrusion detection policy in place, you can then base also intrusion protect prevention policies in place. So this leads us to another interesting topic, uh, which was about policy enforcement. So I already mentioned open policy agent about that. And it seems that there are also some propriety solutions that are gaining momentum in this space. So for example, uh, Cisco had a sponsor demo that was showing that you can write one policy and that will automatically propagate the system in order to configure firewall rules, to allow load balancer to direct traffic, to reconfigure security groups, um, to reconfigure cluster ingress and so on. So this way you have only one source of truth and then this propagates and opens all of the different channels through which network traffic needs to go through. At the same time, they were also demonstrating that 
uh, you can also set up custom rail guards to say that, well, I know that maybe somebody would like to open an additional port on the load balancer, but we really only allow port, port 443, no matter what this single policy would like to open up. So it, it was really interesting to see this approach of having one policy and then no longer configuring manually all of these various devices to let traffic in. Key management uh, was also a very interesting topic when it comes to security. The idea is that there's an increasing need to distribute keys and to identify the various processes that are running your, in, your, um, in your cluster, but in a way that is secure, like not, not sharing these credentials or not, uh, not having them show up in source code or stuff like that. And there are quite a few projects that stood out on this space. Uh, SOS, for example, is a very, had a very nice uh, lightning talk that basically just offers a very easy encryption and decryption of Kubernetes secrets via the provider's key management system. And this basically means that you just put encrypted secrets in your source code. And then if you as a developer or a pod or a virtual machine inside the Kubernetes cluster have access to a certain key of the cloud provider, then you can encrypt and decrypt those Kubernetes secrets. Otherwise, you just look at a file that pretty much looks like a pseudo-generated random number to you. Another approach is spearheaded by the Spire or Spiti uh, standard. And what this one basically does is that it tries to attach an identity to all kinds of things in your cluster, such as nodes, containers, or processes. And in order to make this process as automated as possible, these things con connect to an agent and they kind of need to prove their identity. So for example, if I'm a new Kubernetes node and I want to prove that I that I am a Kubernetes node, I would need to present this agent some kind of information, such as metadata or such as a special file that only I can access. And this way then the agent, uh, the central Spire agent trusts that, yes, you seem to be whoever you claim to be. I checked it and here's your certificate so that you can prove everybody else throughout the system that you are who you claim to be. All righty, and I would say that this is a pretty good pick. We could, of course, it was four days, so it's difficult to summarize within half an hour everything that we have seen and all the interesting talks and presentations. But I hope that we gave you a pretty good overview of the more interesting that we have seen. And we're very much open to questions right now in case we arouse your curiosity and you would like to know more about something. Okay, so while waiting a bit for questions, can I ask you, Christian, what's, uh, what's your view on where is the cloud native community going next year? What will be the next directions? You mean uh, community-wise or technology-wise? Start by technology. Okay. Um, so I think that more projects will be graduating. I would expect probably some storage-related projects to graduate. Um, I expect there to be a little bit more competition in the GitOps space. There is a bit of an interesting development there because the Argo and the Flux project were expected to merge last year, and now they decided rather to split ways. So probably we'll see increasing competition there. And then I also noticed that um, how exactly should GitOps really work? Should it be push style where the source code is pushed via CI CD pipeline into production, or should it be rather a production cluster that pulls these changes um, into it? It's still not a question that is settled, and probably there will be solutions for a bit of, of both uh, approaches. Yeah, so I, I could I could kind of get the feeling that the main building blocks of the Cloud Native Foundation has been have been built, and probably from now on it's going to be only more consolidation and polishing and and hopefully the cluster API, which let's say is the major remaining building block, uh, will get polished by next year. And then we will be all done with setting up Kubernetes clusters and it will just magically happen for us. Yeah, yeah. there seems to be big momentum towards, as you mentioned, pro away clusters, but and then there comes the next level of abstraction. So how do we really manage all of these clusters then? Would it be a cluster API or what do you see in the future then? Well, there are certainly already some, some uh, competing solutions. First of all, each cloud providers have their own API to create. So AWS has its own API to create an EKS cluster, and you can do that via their GitOps tool, CloudFormation. And of course, you have similar platforms also on top of Google and on Azure. Uh, Terraform, of course, is also very keen on reserving this space and to kind of become the go-to guide for, go-to go tool for 
managing infrastructure. Um, but one can see that the community really wants to push. Ah, there, there was also SAP that has had Gardner, so yet another approach to managing Kubernetes cluster. But you can see that the community, it, it takes a lot more time, right? Because you have so many ver people that need to agree on a single standard, a single way to create Kubernetes cluster and take into account all the differences between clouds, but on the other hand, still offer a reasonably unifying infrastructure in interface behind the scenes. But I'm pretty much expecting that Cluster API will eventually uh, win the terrain. And then hopefully all the other tools will just nicely integrate the Cluster API or potentially offer Cluster API compatible interfaces and yeah, more consolidation in this space would be really beneficial. There was one panel discussing the sort of abstraction levels and coming to the conclusion that Kubernetes was becoming boring. Would you agree to that? In the sense that it's not so exciting to use anymore or not so hazardous. I, I would say, yeah, I kind of agree with, uh, with the idea that it's boring. I also followed another panel where they were saying that I think somebody was having a post where 70% of the organization will standardize on Kubernetes by 2025. So one can see that um, it has not only become a project or a container orchestration tool, but it's that kind of moved out of that and become the go-to solution for managing complex things. And I think this, this idea of a custom resource definition and the controller with the reconciliation loop that has found so much momentum and so much interest for various other um, applications. So yeah, I agree with you that let's say the, the more trivial use cases for Kubernetes, such as stateless applications and things like that have kind of already been dealt with and everybody's really happy with the job that it does. And now people are just craving for more interesting use cases, like how do you manage a telco grade network or how do you um, push things safely, but also securely into the Kubernetes cluster or, you know, or how do you deal with stateful uh, applications? So I, th I think, yeah, I, I completely agree with you that Kubernetes has kind of become uh, boring and the focus is shifting out. Okay, now we have the standard. What do we build on top of it to bring as much value as possible? Interesting. What would you see as the main challenges for an organization looking into adopting Kubernetes and cloud native technology today? Have not starting yet. I mean, there's, there's more maturity, but I mean, the ecosystem is also so much richer than just a few years ago. So I didn't quite get this from the conference, but from my own experience, I see um, a few challenges. Uh, there was, for example, a talk about, I'm a project manager, why should I care about Kubernetes? So you notice that Kubernetes is a little bit seen as a geeky territory, something that only engineers should care about. And then once you're talking to your product manager about, oh, we need to upgrade the Kubernetes cluster, or how about we move into the cloud native, how, how about we move our legacy workloads to cloud native stack? They don't really see a value in this and they just see that that's overhead as you know, engineering is doing their engineering things. And it takes quite some effort to convince them that, okay, you're, you're really investing into speeds that you're going to amortize over the future. So probably that's one of the challenges to really um, explain Kubernetes at a level that can be understood by the higher ups, by product managers, by VPs of, well, VPs of engineering, I assume they, they, they can understand this already, but VP of product and maybe even the CEO who really understands what's the value and why this is so important for the team. And yeah, I would say that the momentum that the community is gaining is of course the most important factor. So you don't really want to miss out on, so, somebody was putting it really nicely that you might be a big organization and you might have hired a lot of smart people. But the Cloud Native Foundation is like maybe 15,000 attendees were last year at the conference. I don't think you have more smart brains inside your organization than those 15,000 attendees that are there. So you better keep an ear open for all the projects and all the knowledge that is being produced in the community and take that back into your organization. So that I would say is the is the first challenge, really educating higher ups on the value of Kubernetes. And then the second challenge that I have seen is that Kubernetes really has a bit of an opinion the way of, um, of producing applications, which in the beginning can be a bit of an overhead. So if you're, for example, just taking your application and say that your application has a little bit of caching that then becomes a little bit of state between the requests and you're porting that to Kubernetes, that won't work anymore. 
And of course, it kind of makes sense at the beginning to start with uh, to start small and you know to not deal with replication and not deal with uh, setting up SSL certificates and things like that. And then only when your product is growing and it's seeing more and more end users, then to you know add replication and add uh, mi microservices and move stateful components out of state stateless components and so on. But then if you're not really doing that first, and you're directly moving the workload into Kubernetes, you're just going to have surprises and you're going to have a really sour memory of that one time when production failed because Kubernetes added another replica to our pod and that pod was not meant to work with two replicas. So I think that maybe Kubernetes getting the victim of its own success. It, it makes it look like it's so easy to just deploy a new image and make it run and, ooh, check it out. I scaled it to four instances now, and now I scaled it down to two instances. But there's a lot of things that the application needs to provide from its side in order to mold nicely in the philosophy, let's say, that Kubernetes is um, and the cloud native ecosystem is pushing out. Interesting. So, uh, uh... A heated discussion that I've been following pretty closely is the that the operation issue. So should you run? Should you operate your own Kubernetes cluster? And is this uh, black or white? What what's your perspective here, Christian? Definitely not the black or white. Um, I participated in one of the talks uh, where basically they had people saying that whatever is under Kubernetes is just overhead for them. So they really didn't see any value in operating your own Kubernetes cluster or, you know, nobody really needs a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. You still have logging around it. You still have a, a networking around it. You have uh, observability around it. And there were companies that were saying like, well, I'm, I'm an oil company. You know, I, I need to drill holes and get energy out of the ground. It's really whenever I... I don't care about Kubernetes clusters and upgrading them and life cycle and, and things like that. Or, or I'm a healthcare company. Whatever resources I put on maintaining Kubernetes cluster is, is really just overhead to my organization and taking valuable brains uh, out of delivering features to something that you know, is not business critical. So there was on one hand the, let's say, the, the white um, side of the spectrum, which really argued towards not managing your Kubernetes cluster. But then again, there were also people that maybe after a given size, they really saw the value in, you know, um, customizing a little bit more on how they do infrastructure manager or customizing a little bit more how they do alerting and how they do observability. And in that case, probably after a given size, and if you have some very special use cases, um, then it makes it makes sense to have to manage your Kubernetes clusters in in house. But I would argue that unless you're above maybe hundred or thousand of engineers. Managing your Kubernetes cluster is just overhead. Sure. So, with that, I would like to wrap up and thank everyone who attended, and thanks to Christian for the very nice discussion. Thank so, you. thank you, and we'll we'll post more information online about this webinar, including what we presented. Thank you, and goodbye. Goodbye.